Professor Lipstein, last week you told me about your experiences before and during the war, and I wonder if we could go back to the period from May to September 1940, when, as Professor Emden Wade once said, you fell under the prerogative. Yes, uh, I was interned. It went very smoothly and quietly, because I'd been working on Whit Monday in the Squire Law Library, when I walked home to lunch, and my good friend Clive Parry came and said, they want to, the police has been, they want to arrest you, but they say have lunch first. After that, we all met in the Guild Hall, and were transported to Paris St. Edmunds, and from there, in due course, after a week, which we spent on a meadow in Paris St. Edmunds, very pleasantly, guarded by an officer who was a pupil of one of us, we were sent by, uh, by train to Liverpool. The crowd with whom I uh, stayed were, uh, had some rather interesting members. Cambridge did not have many elderly refugees. We were all young people, and ours was a potential rather than a real status. But the Roots later on got a Nobel Prize, Michael Kerr, who was a student, became a Lord Justice of Appeal. Another became professor at the University of Cambridge in Science. And one became the Astronomer Royal for, Opera, for, uh, for Scotland. Uh, so, it was quite an interesting number of people. One whom nobody else recognised, but of whom one said he looks like Frederick II, the Great of, uh, of Prussia, was, in fact, the eldest son of the grandson of the Kaiser, who had been tucked away in Cambridge to be saved from the National Socialists, and who was uh, studying at Corpus Christi under one of the family names, which, of course, none of us knew. I got to know him quite well. He was a good companion, not uncomplaining, and capable of dealing with all the drudgery which occurred for us. That's fascinating, Professor. He, I still remember that uh, we were given, or he was given, uh, some writing paper which was designed so as not to be capable of being used for secret messages. It looked awful. And there he was saying, very awkward, very awkward. My aunt has a birthday. I cannot send her this. The aunt was, of course, Queen Mary. <laughs> so the war ended and you became a lecturer. Did you find that the law school and the library had changed greatly and that um, do you have recollections of the immediate post-war period as people came flooding back? Yes, there was a great change. Unlike in the First World War, uh, the university had not uh, closed down, but it had worked on a very reduced level. And the Faculty of Law probably had not more than 60 students, partly those who had not yet been called up, partly those who were, were not going to be called up, and partly some members from the Commonwealth who would come. And now suddenly, we had several hundred people flooding in and had to start the whole new course. What's more, these were people who had been through the war. Many had been officers. They were people who had a mind of their own. I was at that time appointed in 1944. I was appointed uh, secretary of the faculty and it fell upon me to plan the teaching uh, uh, as these people flooded back to administer the faculty, to deal with the finances, and uh, to represent it in every respect. So did you think that the library was able to cope with this influx? The library was not bad, and in those days the demands on reading were not as hard and as detailed as they were now, especially since these people were all intending to read the primary courses and not to do research. So you found yourself on the library committee for a number of years. 
roughly from 1946 through to 1974, and several well-known academics were on the committee at this time, and I wonder if we could start with your recollections of Professor Hampson. Hampson uh, was the son of the British consul in Istanbul and of his wife, who was a French woman, and this determined his whole character. He was fluent in French, he was very much attached to France, and uh, he was also conversant with Greek because he'd grown up partly in uh, Istanbul, and uh, as a result was a man of very broad culture. He was a classical scholar, and uh, he was one of the early young lecturers in the law school who made a name for himself. When I met him, he was a very active person, interested mainly in contract but also introducing foreign law because he was fluent in French, and of course he was a man who had been interned in Germany for, uh, for six years because he'd been a member of the contingent which had been sent to Greece when Germany invaded Greece in 1940 and he had been captured. Six years of imprisonment has left, left a permanent imprint on his personality. Thank you. So he served on the committee from 1947 to 64 and he was the chairman from 55 to 57. Someone else I'd like to ask you about is Sir William Wade who's not to be confused with Professor Emlyn Wade. Sir William Wade served on the Library Committee from 1937 to 62. Bill Wade was one of the outstanding students in the pre-war period, in 1938. Uh, during the war, he was mainly used uh, as a member of the British delegation in the United States where he married an English, uh, American woman. He was an extremely able man, specializing in property law and administrative law. In both uh, places he made a name for himself. He was always precise and to the point. Thank you. Professor Robbie Jennings was on the committee from 1957 to 1972 and the chairman from 1963 to 72. He, him I knew well. When I joined as Cambridge as a student, he too was a student but already enjoying a scholarship to America. Uh, I did not see much of him during the war. He was mainly attached to intelligence in the army and I think in, in India. Um, he was an, outs uh, an outgoing person, capable, friendly, and who probably left a considerable imprint on the faculty. And Mr. Dias, who was around between 1959 and 62 on the committee? An able lawyer specializing in Roman law because he was originally uh, uh, from Ceylon, belonging to a well-known family there. Uh, I knew him quite well. He was a good, excellent teacher, and in the course of his life was a co-editor co with uh, Marcusinis of a book on the law of thought, of which I think he probably bore a very strong brunt. Thank you. And Dr. Glanville Williams, who was on the committee from 1957 to 67 and chairman from 66 to 67, he was an old friend of mine to whom I owe a great debt of gratitude. We were both research students in 1934, he at John's, I at Trinity. At that time he was a very lively, happy, uh, friendly, 
young man with blonde curls and a love for hiking and going out uh, on uh, uh, tours. He was one of the best pupils of Winfield who said that when he was a student for PhD that really he deserved to have an LLD when he wrote his book on uh, the liability for animals. When the war came, he uh, took a step which affected his whole career. He became a conscientious objector, and this led in due course to his loss of his fellowship. And uh, when the war had come out, and his remaining really a teacher was out of a college. And after the war, he accepted an appointment to London, only to come back later on to a professorship when most of his past history was forgotten. Thank you. In 1938, Willy Steiner, a refugee from Austria where he had studied law, came to the UK and studied for his bar exams. He then worked for the LSE before his appointment in 1959 as assistant librarian at the Squire. This was a full-time position, while Dr Ellis Lewis was a part-time librarian. One of the things Willie did was to re-catalogue the collections. The catalogue was printed in book form and is still used today, and he devised a new classification scheme for the library. Did these two innovations have a significant impact upon the library and its users? I believe they did, although it met with a certain antagonism. Uh, placing books on shelves merely by indicating the shelf in which there, where there are uh, is an incomplete method, especially since books have to be moved and therefore soon the inscriptions are wrong. He devised the scheme very detailed as to subject matters and I believe that it has worked. Prior to Willie's arrival, there had been a long-serving team of Dr. Ellis Lewis, Teddy Hill and Clarence Staines. How did Willie's arrival into the stable team alter the way that the library was run? Before then, it was run by amateurs, not by Dr. Ellis Lewis. He was, of course, a lawyer, but then he was not a librarian and his greatest strength was his relationship to his pupils, not to the books. Uh, so it was very much, at that matter, time a matter of Staines and Hill, who ran the, sh uh, the show, but that meant that they were capable of uh, classifying, uh, putting books away, and uh, generally looking to the maintenance of the collection rather than to its expansion or its completion. In 1968, Willie was responsible for appointing Mr. Peter Savada to the library staff. Today, Peter is Head of Reader Services. Do you have any recollections of him in those early days? A very helpful young man who gave a lot of his time to keeping the library in good order, but uh, of course his real services only came into being after the war. Professor Perry, when chairman of the library committee in 1968, wrote that Willie had succeeded in transforming the library. I have no doubt that Perry was right. He transferred the library from a useful the library at English common law to one of a research library which enabled people to deal with uh, a wide, worldwide range of books um, in a great number of subject matters. Thank you very much, Professor. Is that it? Thank you.